Welcome to the Advanced Sports Analytics Show here on Roto Grinders, brought to you by Jock Market. Stop throwing your money away. It's time to check out Jock Market, the app where daily fantasy becomes a stock exchange. Buy and sell shares of players in real time for real money. Download now for a 100% deposit match up to $50 using the promo code GRINDERS. And get this, if you don't turn a profit this week, Jock Market is running back their first market guarantee to cover your losses this week. So download Jock Market in the app or play stores or check out Jock Market, J-O-C-K-M-K-T.com and use the code GRINDERS for a 100% deposit match up to $50 on your first deposit. I'm Jordan Cooper, a.k.a. Blender Ed, Blender HD. If you want to follow me there on Twitter, joined by the man behind the dials, the, the numbers, the, the scripts that are running incessantly <laughs> and forever on your computer. It is uh, Stuart Gibson from Advanced Sports Analytics. Uh, you, you've been having a problem with your scripts. Uh, do, do we know all the quarterbacks that are starting this week? We have a bunch of yeah, teams. yeah. Uh, no, I think I, I think we've got that dialed in correctly. Um, yeah, and just rerunning through some uh, simulation scripts, and uh, I, you know, I, 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 it's usually kind of a long runtime process, so I don't know if it's. Uh, you know, I have too many applications open and it's running uh, particularly slow today or if there's, um, I don't know, some 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 deeper issue in there that I need to look at after the show. But um, yeah, hopefully we can get that through uh, kind of as as the show unfolds and, uh, you know, have some fresh data to look at. But uh, we'll, we'll but work on that. You have to run that now. on Saturdays for like if there's new news, questionable stuff. I mean, I mean, it's, it's something that it, it's not like you run it once. And then, uh, you know, on Wednesday, like a lot of people look at look at our projections at Roto Grinders on like a Wednesday in our ownership. And it's like, like this is this isn't I mean, like you look at the injury report, you know, some quarterbacks may not be playing. You see the line movement. And uh, that's why the closer it is like you. you I mean, truthfully, Stuart, I mean, the probably the most accurate uh, time is like after inactives on Sunday. Uh, but I'm I'm assuming that that your 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 scripts like as long, it, the the inactives on Sunday may not like a lot of times probably don't matter that much. They only marginally. Oh, this the backup offensive lineman is out. Like does like does that affect like much of what you do? Those simulations. Yeah, not so much. Um... Yeah, I mean, the script's usually like a, a kind of like a 20 minute type thing. And I, I feel like now we're probably going on 40 minutes, which uh, is is a bit concerning. But yeah, I mean, it, it usually sets up well where you can like run something, kind of do uh, final processing uh, after an actives, you know, giving it maybe 15 minutes just in case there's any kind of late stuff that trickles through. Um, yeah, I mean, usually like offensive line type stuff doesn't... Uh, you know, have any impact unless it has like a, a palpable impact on, I guess, the, the spread or game total, um, something like how, that. How about, but... how about stuff that wouldn't affect the game total? Like we, we often see, uh, well, often enough see, like especially in running back committee type of teams where it's like, oh, we're expecting a, three, a three-way timeshare. And then in, it's like, oh, uh, Ramondre Stevenson is an active, right? Like, like what that third running back, which means like you may have originally gave them like a, you know, 10% snap share and a, you know, 6% target share. And now you have to kind of like divvy that out to either the running backs that exist or, you know, in some fashion. So if anything, I think like that, the skill position players for in that time period marry more than, than like kind of like def defensive matchups and offensive line. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, what, what you're talking about is kind of, uh, reallocating uh kind of manual edit what, what we do manually um or at least initiate through an automated program but you know manually tweak and fine tune uh yeah you know you put following inactives or 
news around uh, timeshares or kind of role or, or pitch counts. You know, sometimes you hear of kind of guys come back from injury and being on some sort of snap count or limited role. Uh, yeah, following that, making kind of final adjustments and tweaks as as warranted, and then rerunning that back through uh, you know a, a fantasy point projection uh, process. And then with that, uh, rerunning ownership projections. And then once you rerun ownership projections, uh, rerunning the uh, kind of range of outcomes projected from a fantasy standpoint and the uh, simulation of kind of field lineups that could be put together, running that all through a, a simulation, taking random polls from uh, players' range of outcomes, uh, Core, essentially doing polls that are correlated. So like finding, we, we, we try to find a uh, like key players and, and in theory, you know, the, the kind of higher, higher projected players should have kind of more weight on uh, the likelihood of dictating kind of the game flow or kind of the correlates associated with them. So like, for example, you know, Dak Prescott and say Cedric Wilson uh, have some latent correlation that being said, more times than not, the performance of Dak Prescott is going to dictate kind of the correlated outcome of Cedric Wilson, as opposed to the outcome of Cedric Wilson dictating the kind of correlated out outcome of Dak Prescott. So running through that, iterating through that, uh, you know, about a thousand times, uh, it kind of adds up and, you know, ends up taking a while. Um, not sure why it's running particularly slow today. Like I said, maybe too many applications open or uh, I don't know, haven't restarted my computer in a while, something like that. But um, yeah. But, we'll, but we'll, even we'll though it, ha it hasn't finished yet, even though it hasn't finished yet, uh, we have an 11 game slate, uh, three, three totals that are 50 plus. So uh, a little bit, a little bit better totals this week than last week. Uh, what, what game, I mean, uh, instead of covering it like game by game, we'll be skipping around a bit. What, what game as a whole would you consider to be the top target on the slate? Yeah, I mean, I think Buffalo's going to be quite popular. Uh, you know, Josh Allen projects as an exceptionally strong quarterback play. Um, could see, like, guys like Cole Beasley getting decent amount of ownership. Um, it, it does kind of seem like, like running backs are going to dictate a, a, a good bit of, uh, I guess, like, not that people kind of stack around running backs, but it, it, you know, we have a few like kind of eye popping running back values that I think are going to, uh, you know, soak up a good bit of ownership, but I don't know, in general, it does kind of seem like from the pass catchers fairly spread out. Like we don't have, uh, we're not seeing like, uh, you know, the, the massive kind of Cooper cup ownership. Um, it, it, it does seem a, Bit spread out but I, I would see buffalo being a, as kind of one of the uh high target spots uh obviously they have you know the the great uh implied total uh pass heavy team uh the, the you know spread is is quite skewed but i feel like buffalo is one of those teams that people don't really get uh, super scared away by so i i would guess that that will be kind of one of the um chalkier builds like something like allen Diggs, beasley um yeah what about you is that how how you see it plan out well i mean i see that the general gist of this slate is that we have a lot of a high implied team totals but a lot of large spread games so i'm to me i'm going to be much more focused on what and if i do run backs in lineups so like i may be much less inclined to force a guy like Corey Davis or Michael Carter into a build stack, like just do Alan Diggs Beasley and move on with my life. Uh, but in the bit for the bills, uh, I don't have the bills as highly as, as other teams. Uh, Ryan, uh, no, Ryan, uh, Dawson Knox is, uh, is back. Uh, we, we still don't know the status of Zach Moss. He's questionable. Uh, which will make Devin Singletary a little bit better of a play. I, I just think that, that, I like Josh Allen, but Diggs has not shown able to maintain that 7.5K type of price tag. It seems like the Bills spread the ball around much more than, than people may think. You know, we get a Gabe Davis touchdown, you know, every once in a while. We got Sanders there, who's 5,700, a bit overpriced for the slate. 
Yeah, I think Beasley is going to be popular at 5,200. But the ceiling of this, the, the Buffalo team, it's, it feels like I should want a Jet on this lineup, but the Jets don't even project all that well either. Like, to me, it's, it, if people play this, it's most likely going to be Allen, Diggs, Beasley. But I, I, I almost feel like there's more ways for that stack to fail because of Diggs' price. Then, then it's Buffalo's fault. Like, you, do I want to play Beasley plus Sanders? No, because I think Sanders' route should be like 4,800 and not 5,700. And then Dawson Knox, I think, is overpriced at tight end. So it comes down to, like, I like the Bills. It's just that I think the total pricing of, of this Bills stack, even without the run back, makes it that they almost need, they almost have a higher threshold of being in the winning GPP large field type of lineup. Cause I, you need Diggs to put up 30 points. You need Beasley 20. You need Allen to put up 35 to 40. And I could see Allen putting up 35 to 40 and like no one that's on the team, like is necessary, right? You may get a Beasley 18, you get Emmanuel Sanders, Sanders 16, you get Diggs with 22. And then you're sitting there going, well, Allen's the top quarterback on the slate by points, but Really, did I need to have any of these other receivers? I'm not sure about that. Yeah. And, you know, it's also kind of a weird week with none of the premier tight ends on the slate. Like that tends, that can be a way that uh, kind of popular stacks emerge. Just tight end regularly is kind of like a keystone type position. And, uh, you know, naturally when there are kind of tight ends that are emerging as supreme value or tight ends in, you know, great kind of game environments, like, you know, we frequently see with like Andrews or Kelsey or Waller, but, you know, with none of these guys on the slate, like it is a little bit of a, um, I'd say a very kind of uh, an unclear murky positional group. And uh, I think it's going to be difficult to kind of get um, very uh, comfortable stacks that, that rely heavily on like the tight end uh, as kind of a deployed stack piece um so uh yeah i don't know we have stuff as of now coming in fairly fairly flat uh, as far as ownership uh aside aside from that running back position uh well the the highest implied team total team on the slate is the dallas cowboys that's the highest total game on the slate currently 55 total uh cowboys favored by nine and a half even after their horrible performance last week uh 32 and a half implied team total for the cowboys 22 and a half for the Falcons. Uh, looking at this game, ownership wise, I mean, Zeke's going to be in the 20s probably. Uh, Mari Cooper is still there, 6,200. Uh, we, we, may get, we may get Michael Gallup back in the Dallas uh, receiving core at 4,000, which obviously now spreads out kind of, you know, targets a little bit wider than has been the past couple of weeks. Uh, that, that projects very well, but I mean, it's the highest team total slate. What are your thoughts on this game? I'm The weird thing about this game is that I'm interested in both the passing and the running game. Uh, we're going to have a situation at running back that we're going to have like, I think we're going to have two or three really chalky running backs, but we're also going to have like, six to eight running backs that also project well that aren't those three. And I'm looking to me on this slate to take advantage of that. It's weird to say that I'm, we'll get to Dearness Johnson, maybe not him, but we'll have Najee Harris. We have James Connor. Like I want to find a way, can I play stacks in a way where I could get the pivots at running back and less so at wide receiver? So I think the wide receiver ownership is being much more spread out. So like, I like Zeke in this game, but I don't like Zeke with any, I don't want to, I don't want to do a Dak Zeke Cooper. I, I just don't see Dak hitting a ceiling if Zeke has 30 points and vice versa. So like, I have no problem playing the other side of this game and doing something like Ryan Gage Pitts Elliott. But if I don't play Elliott in this game, I'd much rather take the Cowboys side passing wise. So like, I, I'm not a big fan of the Ryan side 
and then using Cooper or Lamb. Like, I feel as if, like, if this, this game shoots out passing-wise, Dak has a way higher ceiling than Matt Ryan. But if the Cowboys control the game and Zeke has 100 yards and two touchdowns, that Dak fails, but Ryan could still throw for 300 yards and three touchdowns. Yeah, I, I, I do uh, agree with you. I, I do like that the kind of the Dallas passing side. I, I kind of struggle, though, with what – like Amari stands out, I think, is just a great value who should get a good bit of ownership, uh, you know, probably the most owned pass catcher. Uh, not, I'm kind of excluding Zeke as a pass catcher, even though, of course, he will get some passes. Right. Uh, but, but I, you know, I, I, I get a little unsure of what to do uh, after that. Like, I think Lamb – just just with the price and i don't think you're going to get a huge ownership discount uh on him versus cooper like uh, we have, we have him my... drastically different we have him oh. we've seen him currently at like three percent on because he's 7k okay we 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 have a slightly higher ownership on him but at, i mean yeah at three percent i i think he would be a a very compelling play there um if you're uh concerned that the ownership might be higher you know, I, I think just given his price, there is like some ownership sensitivity there. Um, Dalton Schultz is, uh, you know, he's not, I would say, would not not price super, uh, super desirably as, you know, five 5,000 for uh, Schultz with Gallup back in the mix seems uh, quite tough, but I, I think will be uh, one of the lower owned pieces in the, the Dallas uh, receiving course. So, so that might be like a, kind of pay up to get contrarian uh, spot I, I might look towards. Um, and then on the Atlanta side, we've got, you know, uh, Patterson is going to be fairly owned, but we, we still have kind of good uh, simulation scores on him. Uh, he's showing up as kind of a plus EV play, uh, even at the ownership level that he's at. Um, so I do wonder if kind of like a, the, the uh, spread obviously doesn't suggest a, uh, kind of Atlanta winning game script, but uh, do wonder with, with kind of high projected ownership on Zeke, if maybe a different way to play, it would be Dallas passing uh, Atlanta skewing a bit more run heavy than anticipated and uh, you know, using uh, you know, Patterson running and also of course, kind of the, the pass catching floor that uh, uh, he, he, he has just given the role that he's in with Atlanta right my, now. My problem with that is that I, uh, my as like it's from a from a intuitive sense if the falcons are controlling the game on the ground the whole game fails like i could see i could see get dallas controlling the game on the ground and the game's still not failing but i think if, if mike davis if, if mike davis has 15 touches yeah Dak didn't bad. get there and cooper didn't get i mean like this game ends up being 17 to 10 you know like that type but like i i just i just don't see it that in that case, that's like Patterson. To me, Patterson's not a running back. Patterson is a is a gadget, uh, a full service kind of X wing type of player. That if if he's doing well, that means he did, did well on two big plays. So it's like I'm not using the running back. I'm not saying that like oh, Patterson's grounded twenty for one twenty four, and like he's not that type of guy. Yeah, that's true. I guess he doesn't get deployed as a traditional running back um you would you would think though then that like you know still a, a kind of like you said a passing oriented shootout would fare patterson fairly could you know he, he could succeed uh in that type of game environment um, but, but you understand but you understand what i'm saying that if it's a passing type shootout i'd much rather have dak as the head of the staff than ryan like i, I don't mind dak plus cooper plus Galloper Lamb, plus Cordell Patterson as the mm -hmm. run back, because it's not the, it's not him running the ball. But all, all I'm saying is that that on the Zeke, if I have Zeke, then I don't mind Ryan. And I don't want Dak and Zeke together. So, like, that's, like, if it's going to be a pass and shootout, like, Dak's going to outscore Matt Ryan. So I'm going to build from the Dak side. So that's really the, ma the main point there. It's not the other pieces, is that, like, do I play Dak? Do I play Zeke? And if I play Zeke, then I have the option now of playing a Ryan, the Ryan side of the game, or have the option of playing no, I just play Zeke as a one-off and just move on with my life. Yeah. Um, I, man, I, I do, where like, if Zeke is having like a big, you know, 20, 20 plus carry game, do you think, 
I mean, he would just have to break off some big runs and just the, like, you know, Dallas would have to move fairly quickly for, you know, Ryan to have kind of a, unless, unless he's, I guess, just getting touchdowns to cap off fairly quick uh, Dallas drives, which, of course, is within you know the range of possibilities. Right, and um, Zeke could Zeke could catch six or seven balls out of the backfield. So if I, yeah. on a DraftKings PPR type of site, it's like I, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking for 25 carries, 106. I'm not looking for a Derrick Henry line. I'm looking for 18 carries, 110 yards, five catches for 40 yards, and two touchdowns. And it's like that. That's a that's a 30 plus point game right there. Yeah, yeah. It does seem like Zeke kind of is uh, at least. Uh, you know, uh, recency bias back to last week. Seems like the the more carries he gets, it's almost like a worse kind of game environment for him. Like he has so many of these games where he just gets like, you know, uh, Dallas just runs him into the offensive line 20 to 25 times. And, um, you know, his really, his truly great games are like, not so much fewer carries, but just more of a like pass oriented uh, type role. So, um, yeah. Uh, the third team that have has a 30 plus implied team total are the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That's a 51 total game. The Bucs are on the road, favored by nine and a half. 30 and a half implied team total for the Bucs, 20 and a half for uh, the Washington football team. Uh, we don't have a- AB is out. Gronk is out. Uh, but th- these prices for, the, for the, the Buccaneers have come up. I mean, Godwin 7,100. Fournette's 6,100. I mean, he's been in that range. Mike Evans is 6,900. I don't have this game projected that well. Uh, But, I mean, it's the Buccaneers. They throw the ball a lot. Brady plus Godwin. I mean, it's just... that Godwin and Evans are getting up to the point where I don't know if he could play them together. Like, for their their ceilings, to spend 14,000 combined on two wide receivers, maybe you play Brady or Howard instead. But I mean, this is one of those things where it's very similar to Josh Allen. I have no qualms about using Tom Brady in this spot. I just have problems with, is the, is the double stack necessary? Should I be playing just him single stacked? Should, should I play him with, should I play Brady Fournette Godwin, something like that? And I'm, more, I'm also concerned about the, the run back on the other side because I mean, the obvious one is McLaurin but he's 7,600, like, the, the, this game stack as a whole, like, adds up pretty, pretty expensive. I mean, like, because how does this turn into a shootout without Terry McLaurin having 150 and two, you know, like, like, he's the obvious guy. But, I mean, he's, I mean, you, you know, you're not playing Devontae Adams in that lineup as a one-off. You're not, you, you ain't getting Najee Harris into that lineup if you're doing that. So is, is the run back here for the, for the Washington football team like worth it. And if that's not worth it, is the game worth it? Yeah. I mean, we are approaching kind of, uh, I feel like uh, two years ago, we kind of were converging to where Metcalf, Metcalf and Lockett became uh, palatable at the price they're at. And then just got to the point where you just couldn't play them together on account of, you know, just being so expensive. And yeah, certainly we are converging towards that with some of these uh, Tampa Bay receivers and, you know, the DraftKings can get out ahead of the uh, Brown and Gronkowski, you know, injury to kind of have pricing bake that in uh, such that it, I, I do agree with you. It is a bit tough to consider them as a pair. Um, I think it's certainly a fine spot to go, you know, just single stack like Brady and Godwin. Uh, their their price is up, but, you know, the ceiling uh, is quite high with both these guys. Uh, you're not going to get them at, at huge, huge ownership uh, on account of that efficient price. Um, and then on the bring back side, I mean, be interested to see like if Logan Thomas is uh, activated for the game, I think he could be uh, an interesting bring back and kind of fill that tight end uh, position that, you know, you, you have to fill It'd be great to get it with someone who's mildly correlated to uh, the core stack that you're building around. Um you know, M- McKissick in these spots has, has kind of uh, put up high scores just on his uh, receiving value. I think that could be a spot to look. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm certainly, I, I, I typically like kind of the, the Tampa Bay side. They just don't quite get the ownership that that they weren't. And, um, you know, I think just they, they skew so pass heavy. Uh, it's a team that I don't think, you know, we should ever be afraid of in terms of uh, game scripts, 
you know, forcing them to go run heavy or anything. I mean, it, it, with, with Brady and Arians, they're, they're just airing it out kind of independent of the, the score competitiveness of the game. So I, I think a spot I'd, I'd be interested in looking at for sure. Uh, is there another game that you would consider to be a plus as far as your uh, projections and simulations? Yeah. So I think one where um, there's going to be heavy ownership on the running back and the game script, I guess, kind of scripts out as uh, likely to be run heavy, but I think they're uh, just going to be not, not low, but, but certainly uh, suppressed ownership on the passing attack is uh, Indianapolis versus Jacksonville. Um, you know, the, the, the natural game flow, I think projects as super run heavy for Jonathan Taylor. Um, but if Jacksonville is able to keep it competitive, uh, you know, I'm intrigued by like Carson Witt's uh, Pittman stacks. Uh, don't have though, not, not totally sure what to do on the other side with uh, Jacksonville. Like Dan Arnold seems fine from a value standpoint, but will probably be one of the more, if not the most owned tight ends. Um, it could be, could be a spot where you leave kind of bring backs alone and just go with, um, well, I don't know. I mean, it, it, the, the, the thesis is kind of around Jacksonville being able to push the game uh, for, for, for Winston Pittman to have a successful game. You have to imagine that Jacksonville is going to put up some, uh, some resistance and some, some scoring, I guess, to kind of keep the game competitive. Uh, so it would feel like you would kind of have to bring back a, a Jacksonville guy. Um, yeah, so that, that would be one spot I look to as kind of an under-owned uh, sleeper stack, if you will. Oh, I, th- I, th- I, view, I, it's weird. I view it the complete opposite way. I think that's going to be over owned. Okay. I think Taylor, I think Taylor's going to be 20 plus. I think Pittman's going to be 20 plus. I think Wentz is going to be, you know, I, I, to me, this, 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 this is the complete opposite. I have the complete opposite mentality to you that I think this game is over owned. The total has gone down from 51 to 47 and a half. To me, my plus game uh, it, this game has come up five points since open. It is the the Vikings at the Chargers. Uh, it's only a three and a half point spread. Uh, the Chargers are a home favorite, uh, but I like this in a in a different way. Uh, I consider this to be a high variance game. This is a game that could be really quick or really slow. Uh, the obvious side of the game is the chargers you stack up herbert with allen and cook you can even pair herbert with ekla because he catches enough balls to do so i just don't i don't think the vikings uh receivers are gonna be owned like i i just i i, I don't i mean we have like jefferson and thielen that like what two three percent or something i mean cook may be owned but like once you like if you're gonna play a stack of this uh spend i want to play i want to pay cheap r- running backs like that's my that's my common build to begin with i'd rather pay down at running back than up at running back for gpps so if i'm going to use an expensive running back it's either going to be in conjunction with a stack or it's going to be you know uh, uh basically it's a conjunction with a stack or not use them so like dalvin cook is just 100 more than Najee harris so, but I don't, I don't think I get enough leverage by just going, I'm going to play the same lineup and just play Cook instead of Harris. But Cook inside of a Herbert plus Allen type of lineup, I could do. But what I like a lot more is, can I, instead of paying 8K for a running back, why can't I play Herbert plus Allen plus Cook plus Thielen or Jefferson? And then I could play some 5K level running backs and still have still have a good enough lineup where I'm not spending so much money in one game, and we do have the Chargers ownership, you know, fairly high, so it's not like they're they're under the radar, but they're about they're going to be about the same owned as the Colts, I think. So I think Taylor and Pittman will be similarly owned to Eckler and Allen, and I think the ceiling of this game is much higher than the Colts game against the Jaguars. Yeah, no, that um, that makes sense. We we have, I think, a like a divergence in ownership on some of the uh, Indianapolis passing uh, pieces. So if I'm looking at y'all's ownership and y'all are projecting Wentz to be very highly owned um, at, at, at the ownership, I'm kind of seeing uh, 
for you guys. Yeah. I mean, double, double digit wins ownership, uh, I think would be, would be tough to eat. Um, right. So if, you see, from my perspective, I don't know if that's how it shakes out, but I mean, if, if you, if you had the choice between like Indianapolis and, and, and the chargers, like, I think the, I think Herbert and the chargers have a much higher ceiling. At yeah. similar on, if if the ownership was that way, if you tell me that Wentz is if that the culture half is owned as the Chargers, then then I'm with you. So I'm, I'm yeah. the, the stuff that I'm looking at is like it seems like they're it's going to be about the same. And I just I just see that this game is much more competitive on both sides of the ball than having to rely on on the Jaguars to make it competitive enough that they're not just feeding Jonathan Taylor and Naeem Hines the ball 32 times this game. Yeah. Um, no, that, that makes sense. I mean, I, yeah, if the, if uh, Jacksonville is not able to keep it competitive, uh, Indianapolis is one of those teams that I think can, uh, you know, get, get pretty run focused and, uh, you know, just really suck the life out of a game. Um, I do have one more plus um, looking towards the, uh, the, the later, the later session, uh, you know, with the, with the return of Russell Wilson, I, I see that as being uh, you know, Seattle being a really, compelling spot i don't see uh many of these seattle guys getting a ton of ownership like you know i guess metcalf would generate like some but i mean i don't not not to any degree that um you know i would be wildly concerned and you know we we know that this seattle offense is one that can go um and i just think it has some really natural bring back opportunities uh expect the game in, in vegas projects the game to be fairly competitive uh you could go Obviously, Adams is kind of the the conventional bring back, but you know, even like bring back Aaron Jones, uh, I think could be could be a route to go. And uh, you know, you just just look for like a Wilson plus Metcalf or Wilson plus Lockett stack uh, bring back with kind of that. Assuming Aaron Rodgers plays, which you know Vegas uh, total and spread seems to indicate uh, to me that that seems like a a good spot uh, to go to. That so I have them kind of tabbed as uh one of my one of my plus teams uh on the slate yeah i'm i'm with you that, that i was going to point that out also uh Devontae adams is probably going to be the most owned wide receiver on the slate but he's most likely going to be owned as a one-off so in order to to mitigate that i think playing wilson plus one of metcalf or lockett plus gerald everett at 2600 at tight end because if wilson's going to be the top scoring quarterback he's throwing for four or five touchdowns it's going to be one of those classic Russell Wilson doesn't get the 300 yard bonus. He only throws 28 times yet. You know, he's, he's 23 of 28 for 240 yards and four touchdowns type of games. I'm not scared of the Packers defense. Uh, people are going to shy away from playing uh, the Seahawks uh, because, you know, of Russell coming back from injury. Uh, people will be more inclined to play a Godwin or a Keenan Allen over a DK Metcalf. But you told me DK Metcalf is go seven for 180 and two touchdowns in any game. I'm not, I'm not shocked. And if he's going to come in at, at eight to 10% ownership, I, I see no reason why not to take the shot. I think the concern in this game would be that you're dealing with two teams that want to play slow, right? You, you need the big play to happen, but the pieces in this game between Adams, Jones, Metcalf, like, there, there are big plays baked into this game if they happen. So if they happen, this, this game could go way over its total, or it could be, obviously, this is a, one of those high variance games. It could be Chris Carson and Aaron Jones running the ball and A.J. Dillon running the ball and 70% running plays, and you're sitting there going, I can't believe I spent half my salary and half my lineups on this. On this. But I think comparison to the ownership, I think this is, this is a good way to play Devontae Adams in a low owned way. And even if you want to play, if you don't want to stack, why not play Adams with Metcalf or luck? Don't, don't play Russell Wilson. Don't play Aaron Rodgers. and just say like, if Adams has a big game, maybe Metcalf or luck. It has, has a big game. And then you, you get, you know, you go for Dak Prescott, you go for Justin Herbert, you go for Josh Allen, you build some other type of lineup instead. But yeah, but, but, but Stuart, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on the Seattle Packers game. Uh, can you do you think you can name? I, I mean, you obviously have your own ownership in front of you. Uh, a stack that is surprisingly going to go high owned, high or higher owned than you would expect. Like this is probably the first time this year 
this quarterback is going to get any significant ownership. Uh, do you know what team that is? Yeah, I think um, I think we're going to agree on this as a as a team to be underweight on. Is it uh, Ben Roethlisberger in Pittsburgh? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Because of Najee Harris's ownership, and he catches balls out of the backfield. Deontay Johnson projects well, right? James Washington has been on the field a lot. So, like, as a cheap wide receiver for 3500 Pat Fryermuth has shown that Ben throws to him at the tight end spot at 3900 Uh depends, or, depends whether or not Eric Ebron is back. He's questionable. But to me, this is, like, super – it's almost too straightforward. Like, if anyone plays this game – like it's like Ben plus Deontay plus Fryermuth plus Swift, right? Or you could play Ben with Najee, or you play Najee with Swift. I mean, like it, yeah, it makes it it's more condensed. So yes, it's more attractive. But do you really do you trust the Steelers' offense even against the Lions? Do you trust Ben Roethlisberger to put up a big game uh, at this ownership when? Deontay Johnson may be the second highest owned wide receiver on the entire slate. It feels to me like I, if I do play this game, I'd rather play them as secondary correlations and not play Ben Roethlisberger. I mean, we don't have Ben Roethlisberger as like, like heavy, a heavy, like we have him at like five or 6%, but most of the season he's been like one or 2%. So like yeah. at that raised, this, this could easily just be an ugly game. Yeah. I mean, it, it, um, from like a, a game stacking standpoint, uh, you know, for, I'm seeing 42 and a half on, on the game total. I mean, it's just a egregiously low game total. I'm not sure that there's just enough like projected projectable scoring there to support like a full on double stack game stack, uh, you know, type type uh, lineup build. And it's not like these guys are like super, super cheap. You know, it's not like a 42 five and like a, you know, Denver, like Bridgewater, um, you know, cheap, like Denver stack or something like that. You know, I mean, these are certainly not like the premier priced uh, players at their position, but it's not like, the, you know, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel with like a, you know, Denver, New England type, um, type build. And uh, yeah, I mean, I also just like, am not, not really confident in the Detroit side to be able to keep this game competitive and promote a, uh, you know, an environment where, where uh, Pittsburgh's going to be able to support like two receivers. Um, it, it would be a spot that I, I prefer to be underweight on, which, uh, you know, not, not, not like Xing out, say, say Johnson or, or Harris or Swift from the player pool. But uh, I mean, if you're going to be underweight on a kind of big Ben Pittsburgh stack, I mean, that's essentially, uh, you know, just, just not playing, uh, you know, the, the, the Pittsburgh stack uh, and, and maybe just looking towards kind of one-off uh, secondary correlations. Stuart, lastly, last game I wanted to talk about, this seems like a perfect spot for you. It's a, perf <laughs> it's a perfect spot to play the Brown stack when Dearness Johnson is probably going to be the highest owned player on the entire slate with Nick Chubb out and Dearness Johnson being 4,700. Uh, Baker Mayfield, That I mean, the natural leverage would be to play the passing game to play to actually the natural leverage would be to play the Patriots running game as the bring back on a Mayfield stack. Uh, the projections that I have uh, for aggregated across makes that a uh, unwise decision, but from a leverage perspective, like if Damian Harris plays like he's barely going to be owned at 5,900, Mayfield, Landry, Hooper, Harris is like the ultra direct leverage point because Landry's going to Landry's still going to get ownership. Myers is going to get some ownership. Uh, I, I mean, logically, it makes like it makes sense, but like this game has like a forty-four total. Like, are these the two teams that are going to be like you're going to play a GPP and this is going to be the winning? Like, even if you get it, like, what I'm saying is that even if the Ernest Johnson has a bad game, right, 14 for 70 with no touchdowns or something like that. Well, that to me, that means that it's quite possible no one in this game gets there anyway. Like, it's not one of those situations where, oh, the Browns are down by three touchdowns. So they're just chucking the ball all the time. The Browns aren't that type of team to begin with. And the Patriots have Mac Jones and they run the ball a lot. So 
Patriots aren't the type of team, unless they're playing the Jets. They're gonna, even, even when they played the Jets, it was all rushing touchdowns. Do you see that is, is the leverage even worth doing? Do you think the ceiling's high enough for the Browns to just like, I'm going to pivot off of Johnson. I'm going to play the, the Browns passing game. Cause it sounds like something that, cause you're, you're, you, it's the Browns, <laughs> right? Uh, the, it sounds like, it sounds a, like a logical move, but from a numbers perspective, there's, it's an 11 game slate. And is this going to be the game? Cause you need both Johnson to fail and the game to succeed. It almost feels like if I were to do that, I might as well just play Johnson in the lineup to begin. Yeah, it's like I, 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 we have positive scores on on both the quarterbacks. I, I get a little lost with what to do though at the skill position. You know, outside of uh, Landry and Myers, like there's just not a single one of these pass catchers that I have uh, any sort of confidence in. Uh, you know, maybe like you mentioned Hooper. I mean, I think like. Uh, you know, Njoku. It, Njoku, DPJ would, but, but they, they just, they really don't project well. Like um, uh, aside from, from Landry and Myers, like it's really a terribly projecting game from a uh, skill position standpoint. And also, um, and also do it with Landry and Myers, they may project well from a median standpoint, but their ceiling ranges are not, yeah. not they're not the best of they're, these aren't big play. You don't. Landry isn't. You know, catching eighty yard bombs and Myers, they like, only catches two point conversions in the end zone. So like, <laughs> yeah. So like, like yeah, they they seem like it almost seems like the three main pieces of this game, Johnson, Landry, and Myers, are like these are the cash. These are cash game type of plays, and I I just like I'm just gonna a Jacoby Myers one off. He's gonna get there with thirty two points. Like that's really not within his range of outcomes. Like that's in his like upper 5%, but not his upper 20%. Yeah. Um, so you're not yeah, going to, no, you're not, you're not going to go for, you're not going to do the Mayfield stack. Huh. Uh, no, I, I think not, not, um, not showing as of now as a kind of uh, stack to, to prioritize, uh, you know, an under, under own stack to prioritize. So uh, as, as it sits right now, you know, I don't know if I can get this freaking script to run through. It's not done uh, maybe, yet. It's not even done yet. I, no, I, I restarted it. There's some sort of there's some sort of glitch or something. So I've I've restarted it. Um, yeah. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Maybe 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 uh, upon rerunning it. But no, I don't I don't think enough has changed uh, with, with the whole Cleveland setup to to really uh, expect much movement uh, as of now. Um, so yeah, the, the, that's not not a not a spot I have uh, highlighted. Um, I, I mean, I do find it though more compelling than say this this Pitt Detroit uh, game. Like, you know, it's just uh, you're gonna get less ownership and it's slightly higher total. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the total is also like we've had weeks uh, as of late where 44 or 45-5 feels like it could be palatable when you know essentially all the games are 49 or lower. But we're kind of back to this uh, slate where we have a few uh, you know heavy hitting games. Uh, the, the you know the, these kind of forty six and below, or and not even to set like an arbitrary cutoff or anything, but uh, some of these lower tier uh, game totals become become less appealing when there's uh you know the, this mix of kind of high total games to uh, choose from. Right, when the Browns have an implied team total of twenty one and a half, and we were talking about teams that have implied team totals that are more than a touchdown over that, like why what why. why Where's the ceiling? It's like I I under I understand I understand the, the 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 strategic logic, but I don't think I don't think it's in the game stack. If you're gonna, how do I get leverage off of Dearness Johnson? Well, then just play another Brown or just like just do, but don't stack the game. I'm gonna say this, and that's gonna be the game that goes 43 to 28, right? It's yeah. the way it always is. Uh, but once your script is done, Stewart. I'm assuming the information that comes out of it will be in your Substack. Yeah, that is that's the end goal there to to get that to run through and you know to have the uh, the data for the Substack. So yeah, if, uh, if we ever get this thing to run through, we uh, yeah we'll be putting out a Substack. Uh, I feel pretty confident that it should finish before the end of the day, uh, and therefore there will be a Substack before the end of the day. But uh, if if we run into some unforeseen issues, um, yeah, we'll have it out. Uh, well in advance of the Sunday kickoff and um, 
yeah, we'll be running through a lot of the same data that is, uh, you know, discussed on, on this show and, uh, you know, talking through, uh, stacks to overweight stacks to underweight and, uh, some deeper stacks to really just consider it all that, that might, you know, be nearly off the radar. Uh, so I encourage you guys to check that out. And, uh, if you just follow our Twitter, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have posts, uh, when that goes live. Um, so yeah, I encourage you guys to check that out if, uh, if you're so inclined. That's at AS Analytics DFS on Twitter. Stewart's at Start Gibson on Twitter. I'm at Blender HD. And uh, it, it, if you're playing on, on uh, FanDuel, make sure you sign up for the DFS OGs League, right? It's a week 10 contest for FanDuel. You can compete with Beer Makers Fan, Head Chopper, and Notorious. There's a link in the description for that. Like and subscribe if you're on YouTube. And, uh, and if you're on YouTube and you want to hear the podcast version, you can just sign up and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts to the Road to Grinders Daily Fantasy Football podcast feed. You get all the content uh, throughout the course of the week that we put out here at Road to Grinders. And, uh, and yeah, and rate and review it on iTunes. It'll be appreciated. So, uh, so for Stuart Gibson, I'm Jordan Cooper. And that's been another edition of the Advanced Sports Analytics Show here on rotogrinders.com.